and welcome to the States of Matter, a podcast from the Institute of Refrigeration's Women in RACHP Network. I'm Karen Perry and here to co-host is our network chair, Lisa Jane Cook. This episode, we continue our theme discussing subjects of interest for our industry's women, talking about stepping out of your comfort zone and being courageous and brave. We welcome our very own committee member, Juliette Loisel. As a member of the Institute of Refrigeration on the Board of Trustees, Juliet is a huge ambassador of our industry and is also director of ACRIB. As publisher of ACR Journal and publisher and editor of Modern Building Services and Heat Pumps Today, she also has a private life and is here to talk to us about the year she said yes. Welcome, Juliet. Thank you. It's a very nice introduction. Gosh, I am busy, aren't I? <laughs> it's really good to have you with us. We're really excited about this because you're a fantastic storyteller, so we can't wait oh. to hear. <laughs> Um, could you just tell us a little bit about your career to start off with, though, just for those that yeah. don't know you so well? OK. So um, actually, it's last week, I have now done 20 years at Warner's Group Publications, which is just amazing. Um, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I love my job and I work with with wonderful people and have worked with wonderful people and continue to work with wonderful people. So never you know there's two days that are, are, are never the same so I'm very fortunate in that sense I started um as an ad manager so 20 years ago the company had purchased ACR journal they went fishing um to bring someone in the business basically to do the sales and um at the time for me it was to come to Warner's or to go to another company and and I was in, in two minds. The other company to me was a big commercial entity. I thought, well, I need to think about my future. I need to think about pension. Blah, blah, blah. And Warner's, in my view at the time, was a small family business. So my long-term thoughts was, I'm not sure if this is actually going to be the secure move uh, to, to move to um, Warner's. So I turned down the position. Fortunately, my boss at the time persevered and spoke about what he knew of me and felt that I would be better placed at Warner's. So I did agree with him, uh, took a risk, and um, here I am 20 years later. So he was spot on. So, um, yeah, I've got to give him, give him credit there. He um, saw something in me that I didn't. So, um, yeah, so 20 years. And, and from that, as I say, I started with ACR Journal. We just purchased it. We knew nothing about the industry. Historically, Warner's is... Well, predominantly, we are consumer titles. So a lot of collecting titles, outdoor leisure, teddy, like teddy bears, for example, um, cake decorating, um, caravan, camping. So air conditioning and refrigeration was alien. So we sort of had to start from scratch. So I spent a year, I spent 12 months sat in front of people, the movers and shakers of the industry, and just said, tell me about your business. Tell me what's important um you know tell me about where our title sits with the other titles in the industry and I just just sat there to learn I was very fortunate that that my manager at the time didn't put pressure on me about achieving goals achieving targets it was just to go out there and, and to learn and um I was terrified terrified but within a short space of time in a matter of months I started to feel more comfortable and started to realize what a great industry this is. It's a small, close-knit industry, but so important. It's it's you know, it's so big really because of you know air conditioning refrigeration. We all we all need it, you know, it's, it's so important in our everyday lives, our business life, and people don't realize yet the collective of people is actually quite small. Um, everybody knows everybody, everybody's supportive. So I just I, I just love this industry. Now, I do have other titles. So I've spoken about potato before, which sort of some people giggle about. So, but, but this, this is my, my, my favorite. So I, um, I decided after 12 months that I really need to get entrenched in the industry um, and become friends of the industry. And I think that's what we've done 20 years later. I'd like to think that, that we've achieved that. Um, off the back of that, we've... Um, I mean, Phil Creaney, some, some of you will know, um, wonderful man, brought him into the business um, probably about a year after we purchased the title. And um, at the time said, this is how we're going to differentiate ourselves. We want to be friends of industry and support businesses out there. 
and um, and he was wonderful. And we were quite quite a tag team, really. Um, we were never conspicuous by our absence. We were every bit, everywhere. And um, yeah, it was a good team. And, and unfortunately, he, he sadly passed away quite unexpectedly. And he's, you know, he's terribly missed. But during the time that we had together, we decided to launch a few things. And um, so we launched Heat Pumps today. Um, I was approached by industry also to, to run a, an awards event for trainees, air conditioner refrigeration trainees, something I'd never done before. And um, I remember Phil at the time says, I'm not getting involved. You. <laughs> he says, that's something you're going to have to do. I thought, okay, I'll do this. And it was amazing and it was so rewarding. So for 10 years, we ran a nonprofit ACR Training of the Year Awards because I'd said at the time when we were approached that I would do this, but I wanted to be nonprofit because we're big on supporting training. And that's what we did. And we raised tens of thousands of pounds that we gave back to the trainees and we gave back to the training providers, which was key. And then sort of off the back of that, as I say, we launched Heat Pumps Today and we launched the National ACR and Heat Pump Awards and now we're doing regional seminars. So, so it's wonderful. So that, that first, oh, do I go to Warner's or don't I, 20 years ago has now borne out into this, this um, wonderful B2B brand. There's not many other people in the business that work on the B2B titles, as, as I mentioned, um, B2B being business to business. Um, that It's generally consumer, outdoor leisure and, and um, different types of brands so um, so it's wonderful Juliet how important was that I think you said there which was really nice that opportunity to learn as well to spend a year learning about the industry and not just come in and and kind of muddle your way through I guess how important it, was that for you oh it was huge because I don't like blowing smoke up anyone's you know you can't and I think to be in a sales position front facing, face to face. I don't want to be talking about things that I didn't have the knowledge about. So my management team were very, very good in, in that support. So the fact that I was able to ask all these open questions and learn about, about businesses. And, you know, and when I came in, I didn't know what a wholesaler distributor was, or a manufacturer, how, how, an engine, how, how does it all, you know, sort of fall into, in, into focus and where do people sit and how, you know, how does it all work? So that was, was very, very positive. And, and I would do the same with my team now, you know, that, that stuck with me. And did you get a positive response in, in not having that knowledge as well? Because often we're afraid to kind of put our hands up and say, we don't know about Something one of the first particular. things I would say when I would go to a meeting and I had my little template um, and I had a few questions, all open questions. And the first thing I would say is, look, I don't know anything about your business. I don't know anything about your industry. Please share with me your experiences, your thought, your business, your, your business goals um, and where you sit within the industry. And then I would ask them for advice. And I, and I would say, you know, if, if you were in my position, who should I speak to? What event should I attend? What's important? What's not important? What's happening with legislation? A lot of it I didn't understand in the early days. Absolutely not. And and I at first I thought, oh, I'm going to beat myself up about this, you know, because I didn't understand it all. I haven't got an engineering background. So a lot of the technical side, I thought, well, it's just it's going in there and it's coming straight back out again. But then I gave my head a shake and thought, actually, no, Julia, you don't need to know everything and this is key to sort of my life really I don't need to know the detail of absolutely everything. 80% will do and that with the support of the business letting me go out there and learn meant that after that 12 months we smashed the budgets we smashed the targets the sales targets because I wasn't telling fibs I was just being mean being open and honest and without that support I don't think that would have happened that's a really good message there, actually, isn't there? To it, it's yeah. better to learn than kind of not yet it, to be exactly. afraid to say that you don't know. Yeah, let people set their own pace. You know, help them identify their skills. And and another thing about Warner's, which is just fantastic, is we take a long term view. So a lot of people that have worked at Warner's have been there for 20, 25, 30 years. So they'll come in after school, um, they'll come in part time, and they stay until they retire. And that's a rare thing in publishing. That is really rare because 
before Warner's, I was in newspapers, regional newspapers, and staff turnover was quite high because of burnout and the pressure and everything that's put on them. And it was always that short term goal and that short term view about, oh, you've got to hit this week, week's targets. You've got to. And, and they weren't they weren't looking ahead because staff turnover is very, very costly. It costs the business a lot of money to keep replacing people. And if you're able to grow that person with the business, it's irreplaceable, you know, and, and no one's going to get it right all the time. You can't. I've got it wrong so many times, but I think I get it right more times. And by being enabled to do that, I care more about the business. I feel part of the business. So I always refer to it as my business. It's not just or our business. It's not, oh, I work for a company. It's our family owned business. And, and I, I suppose sometimes people think, oh, oh, you own the business. No, 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 I don't. But that's how we feel. That's how we're managed. And it's so important to, for me and for our culture in the business to continue that. And it, and it works and it has worked. And it's not often that we have staff turnover. But we do have many ladies that will go on maternity leave and then they'll come back again. Then they'll go on maternity leave again and then come back again. And we value I'm saying we again, we value um, loyalty. We value different types of people because everyone's got different skills and we don't expect everybody to do everything and have 100% knowledge in everything because it's impossible and it's unrealistic. So I'm very fortunate that my boss 20 years ago um, didn't let me say no and turn the job down. Yeah, sometimes you just have to roll with things, don't you? And I think that you're a good person for doing that. Um, oh, thank you. And you know, and that's sort of the result of it is, is that you're in a really quite unique position because, as you say, you, you get to network with everybody. Mm. So you see everything. There's mm. very few of us that do because we all work in our own individual silos. You, you, yeah. You've got a unique um, viewpoint, I suppose, and that really played a big part in in sort of the work that you did at the IOR as well because you have that satellite view and you can mm. bring bring that all together mm. um so it's, it's really special and, oh thank um, you you you're definitely that's a really good point actually Lisa Jen I never thought about that about silos because that's I, I suppose that's what I didn't understand initially with the industry with the different sectors within the industry with those different silos and it took me a long time for it all to to fall into place and by asking all those questions and taking the time to understand it and as I said I didn't get it right a lot um, of the time initially but what that then did for me and for the company that, where the company would benefit is that I was able to understand what we needed to do as a journal so I was able to then sit back have the time and think about okay well this is important to this part of the sector and, and this is important to them and then how can we put this together where do we get that knowledge where do we get that information from and how do we deliver that so we changed our content in as much as don't just send us the press release and we'll run it because everyone can do that we we want to dig deeper we want to find out I mean training we're so big on training it's you know for 20 years we've still been talking about about training and getting new people into the industry and the IOR are big on that and manufacturers are big on that. Everybody, you know, is, is looking at training, which is why we did TOTI training of the year. Um, so yeah, we, we are able to make decisions about the content and how we deliver that. I have never been told by Stephen Warner who owns the business, um, two brothers, um, Stephen and Philip, and or my my immediate manager Simon Moody. I've never been told by them, Juliet. You need to do this. Or you need to launch that, or you need to do. I remember the first time Phil and I thought about um, launching heat pumps today, and that was probably about fifteen years ago. And he um, he kept saying, he says, Juliet, I'm getting these press releases and it's about heat pumps. He says, I'm not quite sure it bits in ACR journal I'm not quite you know so we investigated it and whilst it does fit it was really becoming you know something that grew and grew well this needs to be 
this needs to be on its own. We need to focus on this. We need to bring two sectors together and help educate. So you've got the traditional ACR installers, and then you've got also the plumbing sector, which we didn't have a lot to do with. But the plumbers were looking at heat pumps, you know, coming away from the traditional gas boilers. And we thought, well, how are we going to appeal to both? We need to get the content right for both. So again, our content was going to be driven on technical, what does a heat pump do? You know, back to basics in a sense, and training. So, you know, the heat pump issue now still carries four different pages on, on you know, there'll be a training article, and then there's all sorts of snippets on um, training providers and, and you know, just, just sharing and helping to, 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 for both sides to understand. Because let's face it, plumbing and, and heating engineers will come to someone's front door in their home, they'll kick their shoes off, they'll go in, they're used to working in a domestic environment. They're not used to going on some big site at Heathrow Terminal 4 or whatever, you know, and, and climbing on a roof and, and, and looking and, and um, you know, working in that environment. So we needed to, to help share knowledge there. And then at the same time with our ACR installers, they're not used to coming to someone's house and kicking their shoes off and going into, the, you know, going in and having a look around. So it's starting, you know, it's starting. We're seeing that, that the industries are, are crossing a bit. We're, we are fortunate. We are unique. As I say, um, I digress a bit, that, that I've never been told that we have to do something. So Phil and I thought, let's launch a journal. Let's launch heat pumps today. We've never done that before ourselves, done that. We're all panicking, right, okay. Let's get all the details down, all the facts down. I'm dreadful with detail. Phil was really good with detail. He did a PowerPoint presentation. We called a meeting with the big bosses and we're like, right, this is what we want to do. And these are the benefits and da, 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 da. And they ultimately looked at us and said, well, you didn't have to do that. You know, the industry, you do it, give it a go. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But, you know, you know better than us, the industry to do it. And we were like, so we're like, oh, that's fantastic. But we're like, but we're going to be spending money. This is your money. No, no, we trust you. We trust you. So again, that comes back from that 12 months of sitting out there, you know, in front of people asking questions and, and then seeing what we were doing. So we were left alone and we just got on with it. So anything that we did was our decision. It was something that we did because we believed it was the right thing to do. We felt it was... Um, the best thing for the industry we thought it was the best thing for our journals and our brands and our team um and we never set unrealistic expectations on any of the team and it just just grew from there really we're really really fortunate to have that culture um and i'm just sort of yeah left alone <laughs> in the office because there is like like lisa jane you said you know about so many events and networking and i'm able to get out and you know and do factory tours and you know, it's fantastic, again, for, for my knowledge in learning. And I'll come back to the office and my boss will be like, oh, Juliet, oh, you're in. Oh, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. but I don't get, you know, I'm not under a microscope. That trust is is incredible um, that, that they give us. So, um, yeah, it's been, been really good. Yeah, for my experience, that probably is the best way to manage people. But unfortunately, not, not everybody can work like oh. that. Um, but but no. what are you doing um, with um, I was gonna say with your heat pumps today? Like my dad always takes my copy and he's oh got, no, he's not a heating engineer or a plumber or a refrigeration engineer, but he loves to stay up to date with technology and he always takes that away. He's like, oh, can I have this? Oh, right. <laughs> that's good. That's nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah. One thing I never hear is feedback. So um, yeah, no, no, that, that that's really good. But um, yeah, I suppose sort of the message from that really is. You know, I just do it, I suppose. I mean, we are, um, and, and one of the reasons, you know, I, I, I mentioned about my boss saying to me, um, kind of talking me out really going to the other to the other job. Because you said, Lisa Jane, about I'm fortunate that I'm in a position that I'm able to do that. The other job that I was going to take, my one of my first tasks was to actually sack someone, to let someone go. And I felt quite uncomfortable about that. Well, I've not even worked with this person yet. I don't know them. I've not been able to manage them, but you want me to get rid of this person before I've even started. You know, they showed me my lovely corner office and shiny chair and we bought you a new chair. And I was just like, I remember leaving, feeling sick. I felt nauseous. 
And I thought, that's not in my values. You know, that, that affected my values. I, I just, whilst it was the big company and it was everything that I thought I wanted and was going to be more secure for me long term, because it conflicted with my values, I couldn't work there. I just couldn't do it. So that's one thing I would say is don't be afraid that if you are working for a business that you feel that you can't shine or you can't influence or you can't grow, whether it's as a person or in your role or your knowledge, don't stay. Look around, be brave and see what else is out there. Something that will match those values because we spend so much time at work. We have to enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with leaving a position and going somewhere else if it's really not making you feel good. Yeah, it's interesting you saying that as well. I was actually at a careers event with year 10 students yesterday and, and they're all worried about not knowing what they want to do. And I said to them, mm. it really doesn't matter. You know, I didn't start in refrigeration. I did yeah. an apprenticeship in a completely different area. And when I finished it, I found I didn't like it. And, you know, it's, I've still done yeah. okay for myself, despite the mm. fact that, you know, I was concerned that everybody was going to be really disappointed that, you know, sort of going, oh, I've just done this and now I really don't enjoy it. But, you know, it's, I think it is important to remember that, that it's never too late. That's, I mean, that is it. I mean, I, you know, I'm 56 now, you know, and I say to my son, I've got, I've got a 32 year old son and an eight year old, soon to be nine year old grandson. And, um, and I say to my son, I said, look, you know, I haven't reached 56 years of age without learning a thing or two. And I look back at my work that I've done in the past, jobs that I've done in the past. I've worked in a petrol station. I've sat on the till at Morrison's. Um, I've cleaned toilets. Um, I've done, I've worked at Taco Time in Canada. You can tell with my funny accent. I used to teach bartenders how to make cocktails. I used to, you know, do, do all sorts. And so it's only, you know, took me probably till I was, what, 35, 36, till I thought, right, okay, I, I know where I am. Looking back, I think a lot of the roles I'd done were in sales and kind of prepped me for that. So I identified that I had a, a natural leaning to certain areas. And I, I'm, I suppose, quite social, like people think I'm gregarious or, you know, that nothing phases me. I get terrified all the time. <laughs> Less and less now with, with the knowledge, but certainly in the early days. But I did feel that there's certain skills. I started to identify where my skills laid. And I thought, well, I need to, that's what I need to focus on. You know, I need to align myself with, with doing that. There's been two jobs in particular. that I, Well, one certainly um, in particular that shouts out. And I won't name where, but I would come home from work and I'd be devastated. I'd be, I'd be sobbing. I remember at times, you know, and this is quite a personal thing for me to share, and it was, it was a long time ago now, but just because I let my customers down, no matter what I could promise them, something was happening in the business that would prevent me delivering what I promised, you know, and, and so their expectations could never be met. Now, I just, I thought I can't, you know, I hated getting up and going to work. I would come home. I, I, it was awful. It absolutely awful. And I thought I can't carry on. I know I've got bills to pay, so I can either let that affect my well-being, which it was doing, and, and affecting my family life, or I can, you know, put my big girl pants on and start to look around and start to align myself with the position that was, was going to be better suited for me and take that long-term view whilst I still had bills to pay. So... I had to talk to myself a lot and, you know, give myself a waggy finger a few times. And, um, but I just did it. I thought, well, no one else is going to come knocking on my door and say, oh, Julia, I, I understand you've been thinking this, this and this, you know, would you like this position? I had to, I had to be brave, I had to make some decisions and, and leave. Whilst it was a comfort zone because I knew it, I I'd still had to leave because it wasn't the best thing for me. So I think it's really, really important for anybody, men, women, anyone, that if you are in that role, don't feel trapped. It's down to you to, to look outside and, and see what other opportunities are there. Take some long-term views. Don't make snap decisions. You'd be surprised. You know, I always think things happen for a reason. And I think we, we are so lucky in this 
within the industry as well there are so many different opportunities that people do now recognize and it's not yes. just your typical engineering route or technical yes. route yes. Um, and I think that's one thing we talk quite a lot about with the the network isn't it that yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter what what you do marketing being yeah. PA secretarial work that exactly. the industry is welcoming and it is and yeah. very close-knit yeah and speak to people you know people I, as I say, I have no engineering background at all. I'm, I'm publishing in sales background and more editorial now, um, you know, and, and people will ask me questions and, and you know, what about that? And I'm like, well, oh, I don't know that, but I do know someone who will. Yeah. But yeah. I'm really, you know, and I love that. I love being able to point someone in a direction, maybe try them or try that. And then seeing, you know, sometimes it's a job move or career move for them and, and, or, or um, you know, about joining the IOR or getting involved in different things um, or putting forward apprentices. And, you know, and I love speaking with apprentices and, and you know, it, it's just trying to um, encourage people to not be frightened and ask questions. Um, if you don't, don't assume, you know, a lot of us can assume, oh, that's that career path's not for me. But until you start asking questions, and spending time with those people um, and, 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 you know, reading about them or, you know, watching podcasts or getting involved in webinars. Um, you, you just never know. And, you know, and this industry is very, very good at that. You know, it's very good at, at sharing knowledge and supporting people. You know, I think we need to shout about that more, actually. Yeah, no, I agree. We we have, and you said it earlier as well, a really good community and we are a really close-knit um, industry and mm. we do come together, even though, you know, many of us are competitors, we put that aside yes. when we need to. Yes. Um, yeah. But I suppose the way I sort of see you is it, it, you're sort of low-key driving innovation as well. It's not just about careers, but it's also about what happens when we connect those people. And so you're playing a part in the future of the industry as well, maybe even if you don't recognise that, but that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I hadn't thought about that, yeah. But yeah, networking plays a really big part, and I just don't think we realise it sometimes, I say, it's just connecting those dots, and especially now, as things transform, and we've Mm. become more sustainable, we need lots of different skill sets, and you have, again, like that satellite view, where you can see people who have these skill sets, and actually just connect those dots, so I think it's really important, Um, and also, I mean, you touched on apprentices, and you know, uh, me personally, I'm really grateful for the work that you do with the young people as well, because they really need that encouragement. They need to be celebrated. You know, they they are our future. It is important that we sort of recognise that and encourage them because without them, we don't have a future. Oh, it's so true. So true. And what's so rewarding? I mean, when we launched Totti, the Trainee of the Year Award, sort of 10, 11, 12 years ago, I can't remember. We're bringing it back as a standalone event. I tried to bring it into the National ACR and Heat Pump Awards, but it was too much. And I didn't think it was enough focus on the trainees. So I've taken it back out and we're going to do it standalone again in December. But this time we're going to Manchester at the Old Trafford. But what I've seen over the years is these apprentices, where they are now, you know, and, and they'll come up to me as well. And Juliet, do you remember? And I was like, oh my gosh, wonderful. You know, so it's, not everybody, but a lot of them are still in the industry and, you know, becoming their own bosses, having their own businesses, you know, and to just see that journey is wonderful. And, and when I was asked about, about launching this event, I also said, look, I'm not having 10 apprentices in a room. I said, they're young people. They're out of their comfort zone. They're with directors of companies, um, you know, what they would perceive as very important people that they would not normally rub shoulders with, all sat there nervous, perhaps in a suit that they don't normally wear, and one person gets recognized. And the other nine are sat there sort of, you know, and I said, I'm not, uh, you know, I I wasn't gonna have that. I felt quite strongly and still feel quite strongly about that. So if I invite 10 apprentices, all 10 are gonna be recognized and all 10 will receive something, whether it's cash, whether it's, prizes, whether they're presented with something, because I don't want those faces and them feeling dejected. It's very important to me that this has to be a motivational thing, that they are enjoying what they're doing and being and appreciate being recognized because sometimes they don't know that. Their, their confidence levels aren't up here yet. They're young, you know, generally they're 
they're young and they're new and they're nervous and they're learning and they're unsure and we want to nurture that and reward that yeah and again I think I have to agree it is a good motivator um mm. just to have that recognition early in your career yeah. does give you that that feeling that you know actually that anything is possible and that you've got people backing you right from the top as you say people that you wouldn't normally sit next to and mix with you, well you think exactly because they can share their experiences when they, you know, and a lot of, you know, our, our industry is aging, you know, you know, a lot of the knowledge is aging. And what's wonderful is that when they can sit at a table of 10 or sit, sit with, with people who have been in the industry for 20, 30, 40 years, and, and they reflect and talk about when they first joined and how things are different or how things are the same. A lot of times it's the same. Um, you know, mistakes they made. And it just makes it seem their futures and their growth more attainable. You know, it's not it's not unrealistic. It's not it, it's real because they're talking to the people who are directors or senior managers or have their own businesses, um, you know, and, and, and had a lovely life out of the industry. So, yeah, I, I, I really I feel quite that that that. that motivates me drives me is is um you know is to see them doing well whilst i'm obviously a publisher working for a publishing company and we need to make money that's not what this is about you know that it's it's i'm of the view that if you are friends with industry and you do what you can to support the industry you're involved then the rest will come you know the rest will come you'll be you know more respected and and People have got something to promote, they'll come to us. They'll come to us first and we'll, and they know that they can trust us, that we're not just trying to sell them an advert. You know, we're, we'll talk about marketing. We'll talk about, you know, you've got new product launches. Have you got new training courses coming up? You know, whatever it is, we'll, we'll look at, you know, the big picture for them. It's not picking up the phone and saying, do you want to buy an ad, mate? So for us, it's, it's being part of it and understanding and encouraging. You know, that's why people trust. are you seeing a lot more apprentices sort of coming forward for things like the awards as well or obviously a huge skill shortage that we all need to yeah. address but do you, yeah. do you now recognize more people coming forward I, what i'm recognizing is how much more training opportunities there are so there is a lot of um whether it's um your traditional colleges or your sort of private training facilities um manufacturers wholesale and distributors all offering training courses so the the national acr heat pump awards in in june but the amount of um training providers that entered i was i was astounded it was the highest number that we've ever had but but training is definitely at the forefront of the industry and juliet just sort of talking about people new into the industry and um starting out in their careers who inspired you when you first started kind of your your whole career journey right okay so my so this is sort of there's three sort of areas here that I'll talk about so I'll talk about when I was younger initially um I won't I won't leather on too much but but my mom um was quite an inspiration in as much as she's quite a strong, independent lady um, and has always done it, anything that, you know, anything that needs doing to sort of support the family and what have you. My parents divorced when I was a teenager and she's worked two jobs. She's a clever, clever, intelligent lady. Um, she was a nurse um, for a while. I was born in Singapore, so my dad was in the Navy. Uh, my mom was a nurse. They moved to Singapore. I was born there and then went back to Scotland and then father's family's from Canada so we went back to Canada for 14 years so my mum's with three young children you know and my dad moved us all over and you know, and nothing seemed to phase her so I always thought well things will get done so so she was quite an inspiration in that I just adopted that attitude that proactive make it happen just do it get it done da, 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 you know so it was always one foot in front of the other made things happen and then also on a personal side um, is is my auntie, my auntie Sandy, who is just an incredible woman. We lost touch for a number of, number of years when I moved back to the UK. And my auntie Sandy, what 
So we moved to Canada and then my auntie Sandy and, and family moved over to Canada as well. So when I, when I was growing up, cousins, we used to spend time together. And then I came back to the UK and we lost touch. And at the time, I remember I used to get so excited because Auntie Sandy would come to visit because she'd bring her little case. And in that case was Avon samples. So little lipsticks and perfumes. And I was just like, oh, you know, little eight-year-old tomboy I was. But I'd be all excited about these little samples. And then, um, yeah, became a teenager. I didn't see so much. And then I say, came, came back here when I was about 20, I think. And then years later, someone handed me this Avon. And I said, oh, gosh, Avon. Remember that my auntie used to sell Avon door to door, and that's what she did. So she was ding dong Avon lady, and um, she did that part time when my cousins were in school. And I'm flicking through it, and I, did, and I turned to the back, and on the back was a photograph of my auntie Sandy, CEO of Avon. And I was like, no way. I said to her, I said, this is my auntie, and there, no. So I said, look, look at the picture. Look, look, this is my auntie. You know, we look similar. So I thought, well, head office is in Northampton. I'm going on a training course in Northampton next week. So I picked up the phone, got through, got through to her PA, got straight through to her. And I was like, Sandy, it's Juliet. Oh my God. So, you know, for all these years she was here. But anyway, long story short, I went over to see her. I didn't stay in the hotel when I was on this training course and spent time with her. And um, she was just incredible to go from selling Avon door to door to CEO of Europe. You know, she was just incredible. She spent time in New York. Um, she was in Trump Tower overlooking, um, you know, Central Park. And, you know, she just, oh, uh, the things that she had done, I was like, oh, if she can do that. I can do it. Now, I can't do that much because I'm later in life. She started um, quite early on and, and was quite driven. And I was just, just in awe of her. So I got my, my sort of steadfastness from my mum and then my auntie Sandy, just, you know, from a career point of view, just get on with it. And she was a really good coach as well without saying, I'm going to coach you. You know, she was, she was very good in that sense. And then when it came to work, um, the last 20 years at Warner's in the early days, we had mentors within, within the business. So we had um, senior managers would mentor salespeople, designers, different people. So our business is set up. We're unique that we're the only printers and publishers in the UK that do everything under one roof, all family owned. So we very rarely outsource anything. So, so different types of people and different types of job roles with different skills. And we were matched with different senior managers that had different skills or, or areas that we needed to improve on, shall we say. Um, and Stephen Warner was mine. And I remember being really nervous. I thought, oh, how can he be my mentor? You know, he owns the company. I'm going to look foolish because um, I don't know this. I don't know that. And he was so good. And I remember him saying to me once, he says, um, he says, Julia, he says, if you don't take risks, he says, you're never going to grow. Because I talked about, well, I'm thinking about doing this awards or I'm thinking about doing that. And he said, well, do it. He says, we're not going to go bust. You know, if you try something and it doesn't work, just don't do it again. He says, but if it works, brilliant. Great for the company, great for you. He says, but if you're not taking risks, you're just hovering, you're not growing. And that gave me the confidence in line with my mum and my auntie Sandy, um, with what I've learned from them is to, is to do it, to embrace the challenge and try it. And if I think something's gonna work, I'll work out what's the worst thing that can happen. So before I'll, I'll go on to anything, what is the worst thing that can happen? And is that worst thing really the worst thing that can happen? No, it's not. What will I learn from it? This, that, that. Let's give it a go. And I've done things that we've tried um, and hasn't worked and thought, nah. Put, you know, and that's another thing. Don't be afraid to put your hands up and say, no, nah, that didn't work. We gave it a go. It didn't work. But what I learned was it didn't work for this reason, that reason, and this reason. The next time I would go to do something, I would think about those reasons. And I remember Simon, my, my line manager, says to me, he says, you frighten me, Julie. It's like, oh, what do you mean? You know, what am I doing? Why, why am I frightening you? And, and, and the way it came across, it was, it, you know, it seemed really bad. I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, my head's gone. I thought, oh, my, oh, where have I done? 
And he says, no, 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 it's not a bad thing. He says, you frighten me in as much as you'll do things that I can't do. And I'd be terrified to do. So my boss has to pick something up and he has to look at it, turn it over, it's this pen, put the cap back on, put it back down, and then he might smell it and then he might turn, and then he might write with it and make sure it's red ink and then how much ink is in there. So he will really go through everything with this pen. And I will see a pen and go, I can make that, or I know what to do with that. Yeah, it's a pen, and then off I'll go. I don't need to drill down, and I won't go drill down. So I will take a risk and embrace a challenge quicker, perhaps, than he will. He wants all the detail. Now, if we had a business of everyone with his skills, we'd never get anything done. If we had a business with everyone with my skills, nothing would get finished because I'm a great starter. I'll come up with an idea. Let's look at this big picture. Oh, we, we can do that. We can fit this in. Let's try this. Right. Let's run with it. But I need a team of people who can pick up the pen, who can question me like Simon will do. He will question me about, well, is there enough ink? What if you run out of ink? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Oh, I better make sure I've got a supply of ink on the side. And, you know, th those sorts of things. So it's, um, St so Stephen's given me the, the, not quite open door because you've got to be sensible, but but the um, the affirmation that I can take risks. Simon gives me the um, questioning to make sure that I'm asking myself the right question and also the freedom to a certain extent of surrounding myself with the right people and the right team. You know, the people that can fulfill the things that I'm doing as I'm running along with this challenge going, oh, my pen, let's, you know, let's let's get more pens. So I need people to be ordering the ink and people to ordering the red pen and, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and so I've realized that I don't have to do everything. And whilst my boss says, oh, you know, you, you frighten me. He, it's not me that frightens him. It's some of the things that I will do, but he doesn't want me to stop doing them because it's positive for the business. He just, he couldn't do, he says he couldn't do the things that I'm doing. And that's why he's employed me. So it's kind of leading on to communication, I suppose, and um, understanding where you are. And if you're not getting what you want, whether it's out of business or whether it's in your personal life, is identifying what people's skills are, what your own skills are where you need support areas of improvement and how you match those up. But in tandem with that as well, and this, these are things I really believe in, and it's not just from a work perspective, it's a personal perspective. A lot of what I'm talking about today, and I hope I don't send people off board, and, you know, what have you, but my personal life and my work life, my values, my ethics, my attitudes, are they, they both support each other which is I think why I do enjoy both so much um I don't begrudge working away I do, you know so so it's it's yeah all sorts of mouth so alongside the identifying your own skills and once someone's done that once you've done that you actually feel better about yourself you know you can empower yourself because I used to be really nervous and really worried and didn't think I was good at anything and didn't understand you know I just thought I was just doing what I was doing and and you know, I was quite insecure. Um, and people will say to me, oh, I can't see you being insecure. Do you know? So, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm human. And it's only when I started to think, well, actually, I've got these skills. I'm good at that. But I'm not good at that. And I was focusing on what I'm not good at, not what I am good at. And I think that's what a lot of us should be doing is focusing on what we're good at. And then either delegate or share and surround yourself with people that are good at what you're not good at, but also understand about communication and how to communicate with them. So I used to, when I started managing at Warner's, managing a team, I've got this big idea. I'm what's called a big chunker. So I don't need a lot of information. I think I've got this big idea. This big box has got my idea in it. And I'll go to my team and plonk that box on their desk and say, right, here we go, let's run with it. And then off I'll go and expect them to fulfill it. And they'll be sat there going, what she just dropped on us? What's, this? What's inside this? I don't, you know, I don't get it. Why, why would we do it? Why would we? And sometimes 
when those things were failing, it wasn't because it was a bad idea and it wasn't their fault. It was my fault because I wasn't communicating how they like to receive information. So they like to, um, not everybody, but, but the key people I'm thinking of in particular, they need to know the reasons why. So where did this idea come from? Why are we doing it? What is the benefit to the business? How am I gonna get this? How much decision-making power have I got? Did I, you know, all these questions. Um, you know, where do I need to go for that? Where do I need? And I wasn't given that. I was just talking about this wonderful idea. Come on, let's go. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna run with this. And, and so it wouldn't work. So as time went on, after understanding what my skills were and my areas for improvement, I then also started to understand how to communicate and give people what they needed to help support me to then help support the business. And a lot of people are in position now, and maybe some women who'll be watching this now are having some frustrations about things not getting done or not getting what they want or what they need from their peers, their managers, their customers. And I, for me, what helped me was, was sitting back and looking at how they communicate with me, how they communicate with others. Saying, well, I've not given them enough information or I've given them too much information. Some people want all the detail, some people don't. If I'm sat in front of someone and I'm given too much detail, I, I will switch off. If I'm given a great idea, oh, brilliant, and I'll try and figure out how it works. And some people, they need that detail. So there's no right, there's no wrong. Everyone's different, it's just different. And it's that how you communicate with those with those team members or your managers or, or your colleagues or your partner or your children or, you know, or whatever it is. It's, it's so, and it was like a light bulb moment for me when I understood that. And I thought, yeah, actually, I'm not going to get frustrated with, with this person, whether it's work or personal life, because it's me. It's how I'm communicating. I'm not communicating effectively. So it takes me out of my comfort zone where before I present something or before I talk about something, I've got to do a bit of detail first and give them what they need. And once they've got what they need, we're both happy. You know, everyone's happy. So it's, um, yeah, especially if you're in a position at work and you're frustrated with where you are, you feel that there's no movement in your job role, you feel that you're not being recognized because that does happen. Um, look at how that person that you're looking for that communication from is, is communicating. And, and you, you just kind of turn it on. It's, um, anyone can do it. You got to, you know, it's just, just identifying it. And as I say, it was a light bulb moment for me. Yeah. And again, I agree. Um, I've had some training and coaching and having identified my own wants and needs and the way that I need to be communicated with it has again it's, it's been really pivotal for me um mm. give me a task tell me what the outcome is but don't tell me how to do it I hate being told what to do and that's when I really switch off so it's really yes. funny yeah <laughs> you should do it like this well I'm not doing it then I'm not yeah. interested I think the term belligerent comes to mind that's what some people <laughs> see it as is belligerent but you just not embrace that task because of the way it was communicated to you exactly that so yeah, you right. earlier you touched on um that you're a bit of a risk taker and one mm. thing that I know Karen and I really want to know about is your year of yes oh god the topic slightly but you know it's yeah a really big thing to do so it tell was us about it yeah so it was eight years ago now and I was just coming out of a divorce well actually it was the first weekend and, and I'm not going to go into detail because again people won't need to know but I basically asked my husband to leave and I went away for the weekend just to go and sort of lick my wounds and Think about the meaning of life and what I'm going to do, what my next steps were. And so off I went to this hotel and spent a you know a weekend quite sad, very upset, all the usual emotions. And at the end of it, I thought, right, you've got one or two choices, Julia. You can wallow in this and feel sorry for yourself, or you can get your big girl pants on and, and embrace life and embrace what's ahead of you, embrace the challenges ahead. So I hopped in the car. On my way home, rang my friend on my hands free, said, meet me at the Georgian Stamford, which is where I live. So we're going to have lunch. 
because my friends were all worried about me. They were all about coming away with me for the weekend and, you know, looking, you know, making sure I was okay. I said, no, this is for me. And, you know, and I had to be, I had to get a backbone of steel and said, no, I just need time on my own to digest. And um, so she met me at the George in Stamford. I said, right, I'm going to have a year of saying yes. And I said, well, the reason why I'm having a year of saying yes is what I'd noticed is my social circles had diminished and diminished and diminished. And, and it was easier for me to say no to people about doing things, about whether it was going to the pictures or going to the pub for a drink or going on a holiday or whatever it was, than, you know, any sort of grief that I was going to get at home. So I just would say no. And the more you say no, the longer you say no, the sooner then people stop asking. And so I started to realize that people weren't asking me to join in on things, to do things. And my social life had diminished and my social circle had diminished. And I needed that. I needed that support. So I vowed that if anyone asked me to do anything for the next 12 months, I'd have to say yes. I wasn't allowed to say no unless it really affected my heart, my health or my wealth. I had no wealth. <laughs> I was paying for a big house on my own. There was also, anyway, so that didn't matter, but I knew I was going to sell the house. So that's fine. My heart didn't matter because I wasn't seeing anybody. So um, my health, oh, I was knackered. But what I meant by health was jumping out of an airplane. But then if someone asked me, I was going to have to do it. So long story short, it started right then. So she said, right, let's go on holiday. I said, okay, where should we go? Oh, let's go to Las Vegas. And, and while we're there, shall we go to San Francisco? And I'm like, okay, yeah, credit card. <laughs> that's where that's going. I was like, okay. So that was the first thing I said yes to. And I thought, wow. And it's noble. So whether it was a work trip, whether it was a personal trip, word soon got out with my friends. So I sort of had like a couple of little or a few different social areas, social groups. Um, that never mix themselves, but I knew them from, from, from different, different areas of my life. And so a word soon got out that I was having this year of saying yes. And um, it was things like, I swore I would never go under the tunnel, channel, tunnel. I'm a bit funny with, I, I just didn't like the idea. My friend Petra's like, well, let, let's go, you know, do you want to go to Han Fleur, Juliet? Han Fleur, where is that? I says, well, I've got to say yes. So where's Han Fleur? So she, Told me where it was in France, blah blah blah. She's on you're you're good at driving on the other side of the road, aren't you? And I was like, well, what do you mean? You know, we're gonna hire a car. No, no, we can drive. And we had to go, you know, under the channel tunnel. I was like, oh. I was like, okay, yes. I had to do it, said yes, but oh my lord, it was wonderful. So when we got out the other side, I thought, why haven't I done this before? This is incredible. So that fear that instilled in my head. I never would have done it, you know, if I hadn't have had to say yes. I'm so nervous the whole way, but I had to do it because I said yes. A trip to Kalkan in Turkey, I went on holiday. I knew one girl, there was two other girls going, and my friend Tina, and she said to me, Juliet, because you're having a year of saying yes, you have to say yes. We're going to go to Kalkan in Turkey. And I was like, <gasps> Turkey, first I don't want to go to Turkey. But um, anyway, so we went, met these other two girls that I'd never met before at I've been every year since I'm still very good friends with these two girls. They were, it was fantastic. So, and again, never, you know, if I didn't have this year of saying yes, I wouldn't have done it. There's so many different examples, even just going to a, a flower show. I'm not interested, but I went to a flower show, loved it. And, and what started to happen then is, is my friends in these other little groups would then sort of meet up and they got to be friends. So this social circle just just expanded and, and, oh, we all became more open, honest, talking about things, shared life experiences. It was it was fantastic. I did so much. Another thing was this, this was kind of the end of it, which was quite important. So when I came to the end of the 12 months, I was shattered. So I was 48, 49, mostly 49. And I was shattered. But my 50th birthday was coming up. So I planned a 50th birthday. I've got a very, very small family. So my mother and my son were at my 50th birthday in my family. My sister was poorly, so couldn't make it. But that's my family in the UK. So very small. But at my party, there was about, well, 150, 160 people. You know, they all came and it was friends, 
from all these sorts of different networks. And I just, I, it was just, I couldn't believe it. So there's my pub friends, there were my very, very old friends, there were new friends, there was my work friends. They were friends that I'd met in the industry that I'm, you know, very good friends with still, um, you know, and then my mom and my son. So if I hadn't have done all these things, I wouldn't have had this wonderful celebration with all these wonderful people. And I thanked them, you know, it, it was just incredible. Throughout the whole year, and this is really, really important, well, it was to me, I took photographs of everything. And I did a little speech and I said to them, I said, over there is two big boards. And if you look on those boards, they're all myself and every one of you is going to be in one of those pictures and I said and every one of those is a memory I said I'd love you to go and have a look and there's a book next to it and write down what that memory was what we did because I used to get teased a lot about taking photos oh there she goes again she got her phone out or and I was like I know what I'm doing I'm not doing so they loved that you know that they looked and they, oh yeah we were at such and such or we were in Benidorm or we were here or we were you know and and, and you know, and it was so wonderful to see them smiling and, and, and that memory. So photographs is so important. And I've, and I've done that since that, that, that year of saying yes. I also, what I do is all those photos, I, I create memory books. So, you know, you can go online and, and whether it's a trip or whether it's a year or whatever it is, I'll put together little books and then get them printed off and then put the year on the spine or whatever it is that happens to be. And then, you know, have, have these memory books. And I did one for my grandson because what I didn't want was to, you know, I'm getting on a bit and I won't be here forever and he'll be grown up. I didn't want him to think that his nanny was just always some, you know, old lady, <laughs> um, you know, that nanny had a life. And, and so these memory books are all for him. So when I'm gone, he's going to have this collection of memory. books. And I took him on holiday to Calcan when he was four, not quite four, just turned four. So I took him and took him to this little island that again went on and, and you'd feed the turtles, they'd swim, feed the tur turtles. And I remember sitting there thinking, I've got to bring my grandson here. He would just love this. I, I, and I was determined I was going to bring my grandson the next year. So I brought him the next year, took him on this ferry over to this place called Mays. I had my son, my grandson, and my partner and his children at the time, you know, it was wonderful. And I just sat there and watched and videoed it and took photographs and Tyler's little voice feeding these turtles and squealing and, and Nanny, look, Nanny, look, you know, look at the turtles. They're coming up and they're taking these shrimps out of his hands and stuff. The tears were just rolling down my face. And I thought this time is so special. If I hadn't have done that year saying yes and gone the year before, I wouldn't have had this time now. So I, I did him a memory book. So last, I think it was last year, I pulled all those photos together because it was it's nearly nine now and uh, pulled all those photos together. And then, then as he's going through, he's like, oh, remember this, Nanny? Oh, I learned how to swim. Remember, you know, and him and I went out on a canoe. It, it was just wonderful. So, so the knock-on effect of the year of saying yes is so empowering. And I totally recommend it to everybody. Take yourself out of that comfort zone do things that you normally wouldn't do because you just don't know what's around the corner and you just don't know what's going to come of it. You know, it's just, yeah. And, and I still I say no sometimes <laughs> now, but I, I tend to say yes most of the time still, unless it's a really, really valid reason or I can't make it, you know, if I'm double booked or something, that's it. But my social life, my work life is so jam packed and so positive all because of that year of saying yes and before that on reflection when I look back my life was quite empty didn't know it I was just one foot in front of the other just doing what I thought I had to do just you know but just the, the, the excitement had, had gone or maybe it just wasn't there but that year changed my life so at the end of it after the party hopped on a plane to New York I'm going on my own. I wanted to stay in the Waldorf Astoria. Again, couldn't afford it, but I was selling the house. <laughs> I always wanted to do that. And my friends, my girlfriends were like, oh, can we come? We're going to come. I says, no, 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 no. This trip's for me. I'm, I'm doing this on my own. Oh, no. I said, look, I've had a year. <laughs> I just need this for me. So I think about three or four nights. I can't remember. Got to the airport, upgraded myself because um, it's my little treat. And it was my 50th, got to the Waldorf. They knew it was my birthday and they upgraded my room. Anyways, blah, blah, blah. 
had a wonderful time, walked around New York on my own, didn't have to speak to anyone unless I was ordering a drink or a hot dog or a museum. I did the open top bus tour. It was, it was glorious. I didn't have to speak to anyone and just like took it all in, reflected and thought life is good. Time to leave, got back to the airport and I couldn't get upgraded. Chaps, I don't know the flight's full, you know, the upgraded bin. And he says, are you on your own? I said, yeah, yeah. So I came up for my 50th. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'll get you a row on your own. Well, he says, I'll try to get you a row on your own. Got on the plane, row of four, I'm in the middle, I'm sat there and people are coming on and I'm looking and I'm looking. The plane's filling up. Lo and behold, I had a row on my own. I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my gosh. So I was quite excited. So I got some red wine and that was quite nice. Chuck the handbag, you know, and as you did, <laughs> make sure I've got this row on my own. And then as we were coming over nighttime, I've never been through turbulence like the turbulence was awful. And I was so frightened. And I thought, actually, no, you're not frightened, Julia. Just give your head a shake. There's absolutely nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. You can drop out the sky in a second. What are you going to do? So I put some music on, put my headphones in, poured myself another glass of wine. And it was like this, you know, <laughs> just up and down. And, and it was terrifying. And all I could think was that if I drop out the sky now, my son knows I've had a happy little life. And I didn't want him worried and... <sighs> I'd, I'd hate the idea of lying in my deathbed with regrets and wishing that I'd done something. And I was determined that that was not going to happen. I just thought life is too short. You're a long time dead. The past year, yeah, happy little life. And my son can be safe in the knowledge that, that that's happened. And um, eventually the turbulence calmed down and I managed to finish my wine and we landed safe and sound. But that stuck with me. So that's why... I think that year of saying yes was so good and instilling, um, taking on adventures, doing things that I normally wouldn't do, building memories. Oh my gosh, memories is so important. And as I said, I don't want to, you know, lie on my deathbed with, with any regrets now. So I'll embrace the challenge. But I wouldn't have done that before the year of saying yes. I would have been too frightened. I would have thought, oh no, no, I'm not going to do it. It's easier to say no than it is to do it. But as time goes on, it's actually easier to say yes. And then you start looking for things <laughs> to do. And yeah. I think that's probably, yeah, oh. leads you lead you back to Earth, Juliet, with yeah. Um, yeah. around the same time you did get involved with the um women in our ACHP committee as well. Yes. How important is you as as a member of the IOR, but also with your work um with the input that you actually put into that as well? Well, um Steve, um uh, Steve Gill um, had approached us, gosh, way back when, I can't, I can't even remember the date now, um, and, and was asking, you know, talking talking us through the idea. And I was like, absolutely brilliant. Because when I came into the industry 20 years ago, um, there was hardly any women, hardly any women. There was myself and there was a couple of other salespeople or publishers um, in the media. But in the industry itself, there weren't many. There was a handful. And I was like, yes. Yeah, I'll get involved in this. I think this is important. We'll, you know, we'll do what we can, um, Steve. We will certainly help support this. We'll grow this. We will run a section highlighting women um, in the industry. We we created an award as well, a category and award. And to watch that grow, you know, we never used to have to queue in the loose, you know, but now there's that many women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to queue in the loose. So, you know, it's just... To, to be in a room, you know, with, with sort of four or five hundred people, predominantly men in their dicky bows with the odd flash of maybe a, you know, a sequin dress. So now I think, you know, I was having this conversation at work the other day. I'd say there's about 30, 35 percent women now that are attending these events. I might do a little poll, actually, at my next event and just see. But no, I, I, I think it's um, hugely important. Women in the industry training you know I think they both go hand in hand and just encouraging people to ask questions and to align yourselves with the people that that you want to be you know don't don't think that nothing is possible because everything is but you've got to do it you know you just have to do it take yourself out of that comfort thank you Julia it's been really lovely talking to you
and I think Sorry so many I've messages. Gone on too long. <laughs> no, not at all. I think so many messages in in what you say and what you talk about to be courageous and and that encouragement as well. So you know, it's been really really great to listen to you. Thank you. Thank That's you, Lisa. My Jane. pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this podcast, and I hope you found it interesting and inspiring. Please download the rest of the series and keep an eye out for our social media posts where we can listen again and see what's next and share with your colleagues and even let us know what you want to hear more of. As always, you can get more involved with our LinkedIn group, IOR Women in RACHP, and help to spread the network. Please also get in contact if you would like to reach out about anything where we can support or anything that you'd like to hear more about. Thank you.